Oneness, the destination you never left. By John Grevin. You are what you seek. There is nothing to attain. What is obvious but perhaps overlooked is by far more than you have or can imagine. The message is simple. So if only for a brief time consider dropping your expectations of what enlightenment or self-realization is. What does not change is real. What changes is only appearance. Forward by Sailor Bob Adamson. This is a beautiful book. It is very simple, direct, and to the point. It will be a benefit to many people. I am very pleased that the message which Nisargadatta Maharaj was a vehicle for is being passed on. This lineage is influencing many and the message is continuing to spread throughout the world. It is obvious that the author has investigated along the lines he points to in this book. He has dispersed the clouds of conceptual beliefs with basic clear seeing. This book itself is the proof that he knows whereof he speaks. The book takes the seeker locked in the confusion of the mind to the immediacy of the natural state. Don't underrate the obviousness and simplicity contained in this book and the search is over. Introduction to Nowhere Hello darkness my old friend I've come to talk with you again because a vision softly creeping left its seeds while I was sleeping and the vision that was planted in my brain still remains within the sound of silence. From the Sound of Silence, Paul Simon, 1964. The word nowhere is complete as it is. Nothing needs to be added or taken away for it to be what it is. It is just a word. There may be an image in your mind about what nowhere means or what it is. But there is something that the mind may have overlooked when reading the word nowhere. It is as simple as noticing the space, and suddenly the landscape changes, nowhere becomes now here. The same letters in the same order, only the meaning has changed since the space was noticed. The simple and obvious is frequently overlooked or taken for granted by the mind. You look at a page and see the words but not the space between them. You watch a movie or television program without noticing the light changing to form the images. You mentally talk to yourself and assume that someone is listening. The mind is trained to focus on content. While reading this paragraph, the mind sorts labels and tosses out what it does not consider valuable. Perhaps the mind is looking for something within these words. Perhaps there is an expectation to be fulfilled. Yet if someone were to go back and point something out in the paragraph, it is possible that you would see something that was there all the time, but was just overlooked. Perhaps the answer is right in front of us all the time. The intent of this book is to point to something that the mind may have overlooked. It is not pointing to anything new, anything that you can achieve, or anything you can add to yourself. It is not pointing to the good deeds you have done in your life to emphasize what a wonderful person you must be. It is pointing to something so simple, something so obvious, that when it is pointed out and seen, you wonder how it was ever missed. How is it the mind could have taken something so obvious for granted? How did the mind so easily toss out the valuable jewel in favor of its reflections? You may have been searching for self-realization, enlightenment, the Buddha mind, God, or some other goal implying the same thing. You may have been searching for many years, or you may just be getting started on a search. Whether you have been traveling a path for a while or just taking the first step makes no difference. This book invites you to take a look at the space that has been overlooked to see what is obvious and to bring that search to an end right now. If you have been traveling a path for a while you may believe that with more practice, meditation, visualization, improvement, or study, you will get to the top of the mountain. But paths, practices, and exercises do not lead to the top of the mountain. What you may see is that the mountain itself and the paths that traverse it lead only to themselves. You may convince yourself while traveling along a path that you are gaining spiritual growth, peace, happiness, love, or other valuable attributes. But is that really the truth of your experience? 
Are you any closer to self-realization than you were the day you started the search? Fact is, if the search is still going on, the answer is no, you are no closer. But that is nothing to worry about because nothing has been lost, just as nothing will be gained. This book will not help you along any path. It is about noticing that space in the word nowhere and seeing that it is really now here. This book is about removing the person from the path entirely. End game. This book will offer no path, no exercises, no teacher, no guru, no mantra, nothing. It is not about self-improvement, spiritual growth, or hocus pocus. There are plenty of other sources for those types of improvement, and a lifetime is not long enough to explore them all in any detail. You may have chosen a path that fits your particular temperament, and I am not by any means discounting methods, but that is not what we are talking about here. This is about a totally radical discovery. It is about seeing who you are, who you have always been, and who you will always be. What you are is not in hiding. It is not on some other level of consciousness. It is nowhere. Chapter 1. Who do you think you are? The most logical place to start in the discovery of who you are is to begin examining some assumptions about who you think you are, how those ideas came about, and whether or not they are true. This will not only be painless and effortless, there is a good chance that your mind will find it entertaining. It makes no sense that self-realization should be work, that a certain IQ would be required to know who and what you are, or that the mind's discovery of the self is reserved for those who sit in a cave or devote their entire lives to the search. Now, there is certainly a lot that can be learned, but for what we are talking about here, only basic understanding is necessary to get past some of the mind's expectations and assumptions. The body that you call yours was born dependent for its very survival. Immediately there were needs to be satisfied. But did the person you take yourself to be now, exist then? At the birth of what you think is you there was just a body with needs, a brain with basic survival instinct, and something present and aware. There were no ideas about what was happening or should be happening, but things continued to happen and develop without you. Choices to be hungry, to cry, and to sleep were not made but just spontaneously arose as the body required. Immediately the brain began to accumulate information and experience from the senses. There was basic programming of course to become human just as a tree has programming to become a tree. So the human grew like other humans, just as a tree grows like other trees. You never made a choice to grow. Growing just happened according to the design that has continued to evolve or change since the first cause. If you watch a baby trying new foods there is a reaction of like or dislike. It is a subjective experience of how the body brain interprets the taste. Again, there was not a choice to like or dislike, nor was there an expectation of liking or disliking, it just happened as a result of the interpretation of the taste. There was no information on which to base this like or dislike. You didn't know it was spinach and that it was green. There was just a reaction to it and the brain stored the information for future reference. If the reaction was dislike, the brain mind may now avoid spinach or perhaps it avoids green foods. Either way, a world is being subjectively defined in the mind. Preferences become known and choices began to surface. Clearly these preferences or choices are based on information gathered through the senses of the body, the brain's interpretation of them, and thoughts as they begin to arise about experiences. We can't even say that there is a right way or wrong way for this to happen. It happens for each organism according to the programming DNA and environment that has led to the very existence of this particular body-mind. As things are interpreted or labeled by the mind they slowly cease to be what they are and start to become what is thought about them. Spinach becomes a good or bad thing without anyone choosing to like or dislike it. Perhaps during what we refer to as the terrible twos, 
these preferences began to have a new reference point, a reference point that did not exist previously. The brain mind had continued to carry out its function, and with the collective information it began to form an idea about who you are. There began to surface in the brain mind the idea that experiences were happening to you. There arose the idea that you tasted food and that you liked or disliked different foods. Without choosing it, the notion occurred that this reference point in the mind is you. Perhaps the idea at this point is just that you are this body, but the idea of you as a person is forming in the brain mind. Where before there was just like or dislike, now there is an apparent you that likes or dislikes. Before, choices arose spontaneously, but now it appears that you are making choices based on those likes and dislikes. Once hunger was present, now it appears that you are hungry. But is that really what is happening? Is that reference point of view valid? It certainly seems so, but by what gauge is that reality judged? Isn't the validity of the idea of a person validated by the same mind that assumes it to be valid? Think about it. The mind contains the thought I am. The mind then confirms that the thought is a real thing. But without the thought would you still be? Again, while、well, you did not choose to do it, growing continued as designed. The same sorting out that allowed the liking and disliking of spinach was applied to things around you and to yourself. The thought of who you are continues to evolve over a lifetime. There appears to be a world that you, as a separate being, move and exist in. You do what you can to survive and thrive, to get what you like and avoid what you dislike, all based on subjective experience. In this world, there are others that appear to be doing the same thing. You agree with others over what is right and wrong, over likes and dislikes, where you disagree with them. But based on what? Based on thoughts. It would seem that reality has moved into the mental realm, and reality is known by what is thought about it, not by what it is. There is a saying that the mind makes an excellent servant, but a poor master. At this point, the mind has seemingly become the master. It has a base idea of the world, what it likes and dislikes, and is devoted to the task of becoming more and getting more, while avoiding what it does not like. It calls itself I. Psychology calls it the ego. As the person which has evolved in the mind, you may be highly motivated to succeed in life, or your nature may be to just take things as they come. Either way, there is desire, hope, and needs to be filled for and by this apparent person. Sometimes things go your way, and sometimes they don't. When things go as expected or desired, you feel happy and in control. When things go against what you believe or desire, then there is suffering and pain. You may continue to work and hope for a future that will be satisfying, or you may just give up, depending on what has occurred and what was thought about it. You think that with adding more to yourself in the form of money, education, relationships, or health, everything will be better. To that end, thinking, reasoning, and imagination are applied to solve what you think are problems. There is choosing between likes and dislikes to better the life of the person. This is, however, the same thinking that twisted what is into good and bad in the beginning, and began creating the mental reality in which you apparently now reside. What is has apparently become that which you think about it. What you are has apparently become what you think you are. But is this just an unexamined assumption? Life goes on with its apparent good times and bad times. One day you are on top of the world, feeling that you have complete control over your life, whether you are conquering it or running from it. The very next day, or perhaps within a second. Everything changes, and suddenly you feel that you have no control, and everything is falling apart. The mind comes to help with the same recommendation it has always offered. It tells you that you need more or less of something to be satisfied. If only fill in the blank, I would be happy. This is obviously a constant cycle, but a cycle that is continued because it appears to be the way things are and is never truly questioned.
The mind hears about something it finds appealing whether it is a person, place or thing, and you need to have it or do it. Once acquired, there appears to be a moment's peace, and then you find out that there is something else that will make life better or more complete. Then that becomes the next obsession or goal that will fill the void. It may be a new car, a new job, a new relationship, or spiritual enlightenment. The mind is never satisfied as it tries in vain to gain control and happiness for itself. But even when it appears that it has succeeded, just a slight change and everything falls apart. If the mind interprets an experience as really bad, the person may be devastated and plunged into a lifetime of intense pain and suffering as they are seemingly unable to release themselves from the bondage of thoughts. There is one thing that is without question in the physical, emotional and mental world. Things are not only going to change, they are changing every moment. Do you see the problem here? While the mind is looking to become something permanent and gain something permanent, the mind itself is a house built on the shifting sand. The mind itself is changing all the time. Sometimes even strongly held beliefs about reality change. A term has been coined to show a radical shift in the mind of what it thinks, paradigm shift. Remember, what does not change is real. What changes is only appearance. According to Webster's, a paradigm shift is a fundamental change in approach or assumptions. It is interesting that Webster's uses assumptions rather than facts. We live our lives trusting our mind to tell us how things are, but is it telling us the facts or just assumptions based on input over years and how it sees the world? As life moves along, the mind continues to see things as it did spinach. There are things that it likes and things that it does not. Some of those things are about you. Those things that it does not like about you become inner turmoil. I am not good enough, I am not smart enough, I am not tall enough, or I am not thin enough. Perhaps on the other hand, there is a sense of great self-worth and you feel in control of your life successful, happy, a positive thinker, and on top of the world. All of these experiences are transient and subject to change without warning. They are not real because they can and will change. All of these thoughts equal suffering, all of them are purely in the mind, and all of them are a lie based on a misidentification or assumption that happened when you were about to. But we don't question the mind, we continue the same patterns as before. The person the mind has identified as I continues to redefine itself. I am this and I am that and I am becoming. The mind is always trying or wishing to be something that appears to be better than what it is. In summary, there is a person or reference point of me or I in the mind that did not exist when you were born. Things are not seen for what they are, but as how the mind thinks about them. There is suffering because this person is at odds with and separate from what is. And now it appears, since you are reading this book, that this person is seeking the truth or self-realization, yet another thing to be added to the person. Chapter 2. What you think about yourself is a lie. While the author does not pretend to know much about the teachings of the Tao, I would like to borrow for a moment to make a point. What is Tao? In Tao teaching by Lao Tzu, Tao becomes the source from which all appearance derives, the unproduced producer of all that is, and the guarantor of its stability and regularity. The Tao that can be known is not the true Tao. The Tao as described above is what you truly are. The message is that if it is known then that is not it. The reason for this becomes clear when you come to understand a rather simple concept. What you are is not a thing or object that the mind can grasp. This is a major point that will become clear as the understanding of what is being pointed to ripens. You may like terms such as soul or spirit to describe what you believe to be your true essence. We use them freely while referring to ourselves as having that, without knowing what that is. Perhaps there is a reason why the mind does not know what that is. 
perhaps it is the Tao that cannot be known. Perhaps it is simply because the mind cannot know the source. If that is true, then perhaps it is also true that the mind is of no use for realizing your true nature. In the meantime, the mind continues to do what it does. It assumes the job of answering the questions put to it, but based on nothing more than its own interpretation of itself and its way of viewing reality. So that mind tells you that you are human male or female, healthy or unhealthy, good or bad, happy or unhappy, having needs and desires, and on it goes unsupervised and often unnoticed. An entire industry has been created to encourage positive thinking as a way to improve this image of you while encouraging the notion that you are what you think. While that is somewhat true for the person or ego in all the mind's questions, answers, problems and solutions there is one thing in common. It is all about objects, whether they be thoughts or things. Objects are all that the mind knows and will ever know. To repeat a simple concept, what you are is not a thing or object that the mind can grasp. When we take a closer look at what the mind is doing, we see that the mind is making choices of opposites to define who you are and to define literally everything else. You happen to believe that you are a timeless spirit of some kind. Are any of the mind's definitions about you accurate in describing that timeless entity? Is it a physical body? Are you an object of any kind? There is an obvious question here as well. Do you think you have a soul, spirit, higher self or true essence? If you believe that you do then I must ask just who you think you are that has that and why aren't you just that? Why is it something that you have and not something that you are? Why do you think that you are a person with these spiritual, mental and physical attributes? Is it just because that is what the mind has told you? Have you ever truly investigated its claims, beliefs and assumptions? Can they be validated? Has the mind made a mistake in identity? Are you perhaps something outside of the limited mind? Are you the source and as such, cannot be known by the appearance? We believe that we are a person with these attributes, problems and suffering because we as the ego believe what the mind is telling us. The mind has a sophisticated web containing the idea of me and the ideas about me. But like any web, the concept is full of holes and is transparent when examined. If you are a timeless being, then the very foundation that this person is built on, and the web holding it together, is a lie. The idea that you were born and that you will die and everything else in between is a lie. While volumes can be, and have been, written describing this ego, it is the direct path to self-realization to just drop it. But how can the ego get rid of the ego? It can't. But that does not mean it can't be dropped. You as the ego just can't do it. If it is a lie or mistake in identity, then the real remains present, and it is the direct path to discover the real, and in so doing the unreal, the lie, is effortlessly dropped as the false center in the mind. The web loses its sticky stuff, the person falls free and clear, and the web dies on the vine of truth. Essentially, all it takes is to investigate the claims of the mind. Now, let's begin to examine some concepts and ideas, the lies about who you are. Upon examination of these ideas, you will see them spontaneously fall away. There is nothing that you have done or even can do to discover your true nature. Remember what you are is not in hiding just overlooked by the mind. When the mind cannot validate something as true it lets the notion go. The seeming power sticky stuff of the ideas and concepts evaporates effortlessly when seen as false. In the removing of the false ideas, the supreme subject seemingly becomes more apparent although it is always bright and shining. Remember what you are is not a thing or object that the mind can grasp, but it appears in the mind that there is a you, and that is a problem if the statement is true. Chapter 3. Unravel the Lies 
if it is true that the mind has made erroneous assumptions about who you are and that an entire lifetime has been lived with those assumptions, what can possibly be done about it? It would stand to reason that it could possibly take many years to undo the error. Fortunately, this is not the case and the correction will take care of itself with simple investigation. Just because a lie has been or is being lived, does not mean that the truth is not readily available. Here are three questions. You must know the answer to each with absolute certainty. They may seem simple to you and you may answer them very quickly, but where does your answer come from? Are they really simple questions or do they directly engage core beliefs? Have you ever really questioned yourself about what you think and why regarding your answers? Are your answers based on faith, belief, intellect, or absolute, unshakable certainty? You need to answer them from your own investigation. Answer them genuinely once and for all so that there is no remaining doubt and begin to clear up the assumptions or lies that the mind is operating on. 1. Are you a body? 2. Are you the thoughts? 3. Are you in the body? While it is expected that you are already reading this paragraph, take the time to investigate and definitively answer the three questions. If there is any doubt, then keep investigating. Knowing the answer to these questions rather than having a belief or concept about them is one of the most powerful things you can do to discover who you really are. Are you your body? If you are stuck on the idea that you are a body, then let's take a look at a few things. If your feet were removed, would you still be? Assuming you said yes, then you can conclude that you are not your feet and you are not in them. What about your legs? If they were removed, would you still be? I think you're getting the hang of this, so please continue removing body parts and asking if you would still be. Now, you have reached your head. That is a tough one, isn't it? We'll come back to it. But at this point, you should see that you are not any other part of the body and that you are not in any other part of the body. Check to assure that your answer is not an intellectual one, but a genuine, gut-level understanding that you are not the body and you are not in the body. The understanding comes from truly looking and questioning. So genuine should your understanding be that if the body were to die at this moment you know you would not be touched by that death. I am not this object. Are you your thoughts? It seems apparent that the thought of something is never the actual thing, but have you really ever taken a good look at this? Think about the word rock. Is the word or thought an actual rock? Can it be thrown used as a doorstop or anything? No, it is just a thought. You can describe the rock to a friend, but they will have their thought of the rock and you will have your thought of the rock. The two thoughts will not be exactly the same and neither of them are the actual rock. The thought of something is never the thing. It is just the thought of it. So the thought of me is not who I am, it is just the thought and not the actual. But you know you are, so the thought of me must be referring to something that is real. You may say, well, I think. But did that I thought really do any thinking? Look at this closely. Can I thought the idea of me do anything? Is that I thought what you are or is it referring to something? Take a good look. Can that I thought do anything or be anything other than a thought? Is there any difference in the thought of a rock and the thought of I or are they both just thoughts referring to something? Investigate this and realize that whether you are thinking or not, you still are. Therefore, you must not be the thoughts. Are you in your body? You have come back to where we ended with the first question. It certainly seems like you are rattling around in your head somewhere. That is where the thinking voice is. No doubt that thinking appears to go on inside the brain and in it resides the I thought, but are you in the brain, or wherever the me thought actually is, or is there just a thought of you occurring somewhere? When the brain is at rest, do you cease to be? As you have looked through those three questions, have you come to a point of really knowing that the answer is you to each of them? Is it knowing beyond doubt? 
if not keep looking, investigate directly and rather than thinking about C and consider this, the body changes and will one day be buried. Thoughts change. They rise from nowhere, vibrate in the space of awareness a while, and then return to nowhere. Memories or stories remain, and will one day be buried in the ground because they are stored in the brain. The body and brain are made of the elements and will one day return to the earth. Are you any of these things? Are you a thing at all? Is there any part of you that is not changing? Is there something there that is not moving? Has what you truly are been overlooked? Chapter 4 I am not. Up to this point you have examined, although in very broad unscientific strokes, how the person you seem to be came about. In that process, it appears that the mind has performed as it was designed in identifying things. But it also appears that it may have made some mistakes along the way or stepped outside of its role as the servant. Did it identify you as a body? Did it identify you as the thinker? Did it identify you as the doer and choice maker in your life? Did it identify something as your life? Did it put itself in control and become the master? Perhaps what we have here is a case of mistaken identity. These questions may have brought up a few more questions in your mind. You may be wondering if I am implying that you do not make choices and that you aren't the one doing things. It is a reasonable question and the answer is yes. I am not only implying that, I am encouraging you to see for yourself. Let's take a look at the questions one at a time. Did your thinking mechanism, the so-called mind, identify you as a body? In the last chapter, we talked about whether or not you are a body. If you are still troubled by this question, consider the simple fact that if there is something that is aware of the body, then that something must not be the body. Isn't it very clear that the body appears to something? That the thoughts of the body appear to something? The body is objective to what you truly are. It is an object. Keep looking directly into the facts of what actually is, in your own experience, rather than thinking about what it is. Did the mind identify you as the thinker? While it might seem that you control your thoughts, is this possibly just an assumption, an unexamined belief? Is it really true? Have you ever taken a look to see from where thoughts arise? Do you know what you are going to be thinking a second from now? Will what you think a second from now be based on everything that has come before? Can you choose not to have thoughts arise? When you begin watching your thoughts, Perhaps you can begin to see that they simply appear, that they come up from nowhere and return to nowhere. Sometimes appearing to follow a line to a conclusion and sometimes just dropping off in the middle of the story and picking up in the middle of another. Perhaps as most of us seem to do, you give some thoughts great value while others are easily released to the nothingness. Sometimes you want the mind to think about something but it seems to have a will of its own and attention does not stay on task. If something happens or someone asks you a question, the mind diligently begins working on an answer and the thoughts arise spontaneously to fill the need. If we choose our thoughts and are in control of what is thought, why do we choose to suffer their effects? Why would the idea of controlling the mind even exist if we were the thinker? And even more graphically, if a portion of the brain were removed or damaged, then the person that you believe you are and the thoughts that you believe you think would radically change. Is all of this mental activity just a machine at work? Is anyone in control? No. Did the mind identify you as the doer and choice maker in your life? Again, while it seems obvious that you are continually making choices and doing things, is that what is really going on, or is it something that you have assumed is happening? We have looked at, and perhaps seen clearly, the fact that thoughts appear from nothing nowhere and return to that nothing nowhere. Is there truly a choice? Is the apparent you anything other than a thought? So your friend says to you, do you want a red or green apple? What goes into making that choice? Does the green spinach you had, 
as a child influence the choice in any way? Having eaten many apples in your life, perhaps the body mind has a better reaction to the red ones, and so you choose a red one. Perhaps the body is not hungry and so you answer, I don't want one. But who is this I again that made the choice? Is it really there? Or did a thought form appear that was then labeled a choice another thought arising and then yet another thought arises that I decided? Did the mind identify something as your life? Once again, while it seems obvious that what is happening to us around us and within us is our life, the statement begs the question, whose life? We say this is my house, this is my job, this is my thought, this is my body, but exactly who are we talking about here? Who is the person that has all these things? Is it the same person that also has a spirit, soul, or true essence? Is the mind making false claims of what it possesses? I am not implying you should give away all of your possessions, for if that were required the apparent, you would have to give up your body also, because it is something that you call yours. What is being called for here is just to take a look and see how things have been misidentified by the mind as belonging to someone. Even to the extent of calling the true self or soul or whatever you wish to call it something that you have. Remember what is being pointed to is not a path. It is not a path of self-renunciation or purification or you anything other than simply looking at the truth of what is actually happening right now and at every ever fresh moment. Just questioning and investigating the false assertions and beliefs, the claims of the mind will fall away when looked into. Did it, the mind, put itself in control? Are you starting to see the servant has assumed a great deal of authority and at the same time built that authority on a premise that you are in control? It is a very nice trick. A grand illusion and since you are a central figure in the illusion, you believe it. Any assumption based on a false premise simply cannot be true. It is like asking, what is the source of the man in the moon? The question dissolves when there is the realization that the assumption that there is a man in the moon is a false premise. Are you the body? Are you the thinker? Are you the doer and choice maker? Is this your life? Or is it all just happening spontaneously? Chapter 5 Who Am I? The previous chapters were dedicated to looking at some of the misconceptions that have formed in the mind. You may have noticed that you look to the mind for answers and that the mind has substituted what is for what is thought. In asking the previous questions you have begun to unravel some of the mind's claims to what is real and who you really are. Are you a body? Are you thoughts? Are you in the body? Keep the questions up and the false will be exposed and simply fall away. The misconceptions will not be missed. Final question and the most powerful. Who am I? You have looked at what you are not but what is left? If I am not my body, if I am not my thoughts, if I am not the thinker or chooser, then who am I? It is a question that will frustrate the mind as it tries to find something, a thought, to grasp and identify as itself. In the same vein of who am I is you and where am I? Remember what you are is not a thing or object that the mind can grasp. Hence the mind's frustration with the question and the search. Remember that the mind is not the right tool for this job, but that must be discovered for yourself. Put the mind to work on the task of answering the question. Who am I? What is the mind referencing when it says me? You will find while at the same time the mind must find for itself that the I is nothing more than a thought or a label pointing to what is real to what you truly are. Thy concept is a creation of the mind and as such is a concept it has no validity. To the mind what you really are is nothing. Even the concept of you being nothing, the mind tries to turn into a thing and assign attributes to that no thingness. As an example, the mind cannot grasp the seeming infinity of space. It is too infinite for the mind to turn into a thing. 
yet all of space is not infinite against a timeless spaceless self. What you are is beyond that. What you are is spaceless and timeless. The mind won't be able to grasp or conceptualize what you are. But what can be done is to expose the false notion that you are a limited being. It must be investigated until the mind sees that it is true, there is no one home in the mind. As the illusion comes apart, what is real comes to the foreground. It would be pointless for me to tell you what you will find. As in the Tao, what is spoken is not the true Tao. I am certain that you already have expectations of what you will find with self-realization. Those expectations will not be fulfilled. Expectations are finite and are just another thing that the mind focuses on instead of seeing what you truly are. Remember as with the rock, the thought is never the actual, so any expectation, no matter how true the words seem to be, will not be what is actually discovered. The mind will continue to try to assign attributes to what you are, while what you truly are is without attributes. As long as this message has been shared people have looked for words to describe the presence that you are. Words like timeless, spaceless, emptiness, the void, the source, words which appear throughout this text. But because these are just words they can't be the actual. To the mind, for something to be timeless then there must be time. For something to be spaceless then there must be space. The opposites that the mind deals with, the duality, is the illusion that the apparent you resides within. If you are ready to end your search, then drop the expectations and opinions of the mind and just ask the questions. If it is true that there is no person in the machine, then there is nothing that you can do anyway, so ask the questions to remove the false ideas. What you are stands in the clear and waiting to be seen. What you are is nothing less than that which allows for everything to be. All appearance, whether it be a thought, a thing, or creation itself is contained in and upon what you are. As with the Tao, you are the source from which all appearance derives, the unproduced producer of all that is, and the guarantor of its stability and regularity. Chapter 6 The Real Are you present? Do you exist? Can you deny that you are? Can you get away from your own beingness? To this point we have talked extensively about what you are not. The mind is left hanging, so to speak, and is in search of something to grasp. If I am none of these things, what am I? It, the mind, continues to look inside of thought for what you are. It will fail. So let us turn our attention to something that is real, something that you can't deny, and something that is outside of the limited mind. If someone were to ask you if you exist, you would without hesitation say, Yes, I do exist. It is something that you are sure of and there is no need or reason to question it. You do exist. While you may not be able to say how you know that you are, it cannot be denied that you are. You can't say how you know you are because for that to be possible the mind would have to know you. You may say I am because I think, but we have looked into that and you may now see that you are not the thinker of thoughts. But still you are and nothing can be said about it. In fact, saying anything to prove that presence is there is not possible. Beingness does not depend on anything. It is undeniable, but just taken for granted and overlooked in the same way that the mind overlooks the space between words. Every moment you are regardless of what is appearing in the moment. Even while thinking I don't exist, you are. While you have always known that you exist, have you ever really investigated that existence or knowing of it? Does presence have a place where it starts? Does it have a place where it ends? Does it appear to be bound by time? Is it now or ever changing? Did it get older as the body aged? Is it constant or moving? Do you expect that it will ever be different? Can you even for a moment get out of it? If thinking stopped would you still be present? Does anything affect that presence? Is it your presence or is it just presence? It is the real in a world of change and illusion. 
Don't let the mind discount the presence, the beingness that you know is there. It will try because it can't turn that presence into a thing. But do you begin to see that presence is what is being pointed to with words like spaceless and timeless? Can it really be that simple? What about awareness? If someone were to ask you if you are aware, you would without hesitation say, Yes, I am aware. It is something that you are sure of and there is no need or reason to question it. Does awareness have a place where it starts? Does it have a place where it ends? Does it appear to be bound by time? Is it now or ever changing? Did it get older as the body aged? Is it constant or moving? Do you expect that it will ever be different? Can you even for a moment get out of it? If thinking stopped would you still be aware? Does anything affect that awareness? Is it your awareness or is it just awareness? It is the real and on that, the world of change and illusion appears. Again don't let the mind discount the awareness that you are. It will try because it can't turn that awareness into a thing. Do you see that awareness is what is being pointed to with words like spaceless and timeless? Presence of awareness, awareness of presence, what touches that? Now before we proceed, we will be talking about the presence, awareness that you are. These are words. They are pointers to the actual. Don't let the mind claim them as attributes to thy thought, as in I am aware or I am present. In this type of thinking the mind is laying claim to concepts. Use the pointers, but don't let the mind grab onto them to define who you are. What you are is not a thing that the mind can grasp. As we continue through the investigation, even these words or pointers will be discarded. But for right now, they are key to seeing what is ultimately being pointed to, the supreme undivided subject. These words or pointers are like stepping stones out of the limited mind and the conceptual person. Chapter 7. Presence Awareness Presence of awareness, awareness of presence, look closely at these. Who are you? Do you know? The answer to the question seems to make more sense if it is asked, what are you? The answer is that you are the real. You are the reality that gives validity to things. You are the unchanging reality in which the temporal reality moves across and through. You are the constant in an ever-changing appearance. Everything appears within spaceless awareness. You are a presence which cannot be defined by the mind. You are presence awareness in which everything including the mind appears. Presence cannot be any more or less present than what it is. It is pristine, untouched and undeniable regardless of life circumstances and the thoughts of the mind. Awareness cannot be any more or less aware than what it is while allowing everything to effortlessly appear across its surface. Presence of awareness, awareness of presence, whole and complete, untouched by time, space, events, or thought. Everything that is appears in awareness. Awareness does not pick, choose, or judge what appears upon or within it. It does not matter what happens, awareness contains it as it is. The mind then gets involved and suddenly things appear as what you think about them, but prior to, during, and after that, awareness lovingly embraces all that is, including the lies about who you are. Even while the mind is rebelling against something, awareness shines its light on that rebellion. Some use the analogy of a mirror to describe awareness. It reflects everything clearly without being changed in any way by what it reflects. You may think, okay, I am presence awareness. Once you begin to look at this and take it into the mind, the mind will want to turn it into something that it has. Adding that concept onto the I thought. I am aware. I am present. But if that is what is happening, you are not tuning in so to speak to the actual presence awareness that is readily available to be seen. Presence awareness is not in the mind, and it cannot be contained in the mind. The thought of presence awareness, as with the rock, is not the actual. 
You don't have awareness, you are awareness. You don't have a presence, you are presence. The thought of it turns what you actually are into a concept to which the mind can relate. While that is happening, you are the presence awareness standing in the clear waiting to be discovered. This cannot be stressed enough, everything is just an appearance within the awareness that you are, without exception, everything. Only the thought of presence awareness can be brought into the mind for consideration. While you are thinking about presence awareness you are present and aware. You can't objectify what you are. So how do you stay with the presence awareness that you are? How do you tune in? It is effortless because it is always on. You don't have to try just see. If you're trying then you're just not noticing that it is inescapable and functioning all the time or you're trying to become something that you already are. Presence is effortless. Awareness is effortless. The fact is you don't have any choice but to stay with it because you are it. Presence does not change. Awareness does not change. It does not move. It does not hide. But be watchful. Don't turn the obvious presence awareness into a concept or an idea about yourself. Stay with the livingness of it by not following what the mind thinks about it. Presence, awareness is in the ever-present now. Presence, awareness refer to the simple, undeniable beingness that is present and aware. In the same way that we have looked at presence, awareness, beingness points to that timeless, spaceless self. There was a recent question that began along the lines of, when you take your attention within to see the beingness. This question points out a rather basic misunderstanding and hints at an expectation of what is being pointed to and where it is. There are numerous problems with the question, but really too often overlooked misunderstandings work together to complicate clear seeing. The first one is attention. Attention is a tool of the mind like the hand is to the body. Attention can only be placed on things. Attention is nothing more than the focus of the senses and mental ideas on an object. As we have discussed, what you are is not a thing that the mind can grasp. So, although it was never explicitly stated, let us be clear. Attention cannot be placed on what you are. Attention can be placed on the thoughts of presence and the thoughts of awareness, on thoughts of beingness, but not the actual beingness. This is a confusing point because the suggestion is there to stay with the presence, awareness that you are. Well, how is that done if not using attention? The truth is that you have no choice but to stay with the presence, awareness that you are because it is what you are. The subtlety is to recognize and specifically for the mind to recognize that your beingness is always present whether attention is on the idea of being aware or being present or not. There is literally nothing you can do to get out of your own beingness. So attention is a tool of the mind and attention will never touch what you are or what is being pointed to. Therefore, it is of no value in final understanding. The second part of the misunderstanding is that what you are is within. How many times have we heard to search within? Perhaps you have practiced meditation as a tool or technique to go deeper. What is it that we are going into and how deep it is? Remember the pointer that, you are what you seek. What you are is not in anything. What you are is not outside of anything. In and out are the mind's duality or illusion. What you are is what you have always been, not the thoughts, concepts, or body, but the simple presence, the awareness, the beingness. There is no place where beingness starts and where it ends. Try to find a beginning and or end in time or space to beingness and you cannot. Again, while there is nothing wrong with practices, remember that any practice is in time. They are limited experiences by their very nature. Practice is an attempt to gain something. What is pointed to here is already present, already complete. What is being pointed to is what you already are not something that you can become with practice or in a future time. Chapter 8, Past, 
present, and future. Do you live in the past, the present, or the future? This is a trick question. There is only the present moment. There is only now. There may be thinking about the past, but when is it done? There may be thinking about the future, but when is it done? There is a subtle shift when the present moment is truly recognized. For in order to tune in, so to speak, to the present moment, you have to leave the mind behind. The mind lags by a split second as it processes sensory input and converts the raw input into thoughts. By the time you are thinking about the now, the ever present now is in a new and ever fresh now which is shining brightly as what you are. The presence awareness or beingness that you are is in the now and there is nothing else. The past is a dead issue in memory while the future is imagination. Now like presence awareness is ever fresh, ever renewed, constant and unchanging. You can't get out of it. It is not possible to be anywhere but now. The appearance of time passes through the present while the present remains constant and unchanged by time. Time is really nothing more than the movement of things across the timeless presence, awareness that you are. Without the mind time would not be known. There is no past except in thought, there is no future except in thought. There is no present except in thought, there is only right now, and it is so immediate that the mind can't grasp it. You can only become fully present if you leave the mind behind. You may be wondering how you can do this. Again, this is what is already happening. You are not in the mind now. It is always the present. Words are an obvious problem, so don't get hung up on them. There is nothing that needs to be done or practiced. Just notice that it is always now. See that time is really a thing of the mind. Because the focus is in the mind, you miss the immediacy and the freshness of now. The tuning in, so to speak, is just a matter of noticing the ever-fresh moment as it is. Step out of your head and you are present aware and now. My mind is consumed with the questions. Am I present? Am I aware? Is there anything wrong with the presence awareness? Has it ever changed? Who am I? What am I? Who is asking these questions? Now, now, now the questions are there when I awake. The questions are there in everything I do. The questions are there as I fall asleep. Suddenly there is waking, there is doing, there is falling asleep. I am not doing it. It is all happening within the presence awareness that I am. Just as it always has. Chapter 9 What Happens to Me Everything is just appearance, including the movements that appear to be your life and you. The you whom we have talked about in this book is not real other than as an appearance or temporary manifestation. The person you take yourself to be has never been except as a thought. When the I thought is seen for what it is, the mind spontaneously drops the false concept and then who will something have happened to. Functioning goes on just as before, but without a limited imaginary personal reference point that things are happening to. When the person is dropped, new freedom is found in the experience. This freedom occurs because the judgmental mind no longer has a you to point a finger at. Likewise, there is no other to point the finger of blame at. Life moves freely like a river, effortlessly through the manifestation regardless of the appearance. Even if the appearance is in conflict, what you are shines brightly and the conflict does not touch that. These are ideas that the mind simply cannot understand. It will reject the notion in countless ways and the mind will fear for its dominance and very survival. Defenses will surface to protect the fragile ego and many of them will be disguised as more questions. But how long have you been searching? Maybe it is time to bring that search to an end. Just ask the questions without expectation of the answer and the wisdom of the self will take over and do the rest. Having reached the point where you are ready to just surrender control, the apparent door will open and reveal the infinite possibility that you are. 
what you are and what you will find is beyond the mind's ability to grasp. Everything is just appearance in the unlimited self that you are. Literally everything is appearance, including the mind and the thought of you as a separate being. Chapter 10 Oneness We have talked about the person and discussed how this is nothing more than an idea in the mind. We have talked about the undeniable presence, awareness, the beingness that you are and how that beingness is in an ever-fresh state of now. As you have read these words, you have read with the mind and that mind has created mental images out of everything on these pages. In order to truly see what has been talked about, leave the mind behind. We have examined that you are whether thoughts are present or not, so leave the mind and what it thinks out of your seeing. Once outside the mind, all limitations end. There is no beginning and no end. Infinite possibilities arise and you see oneness in everything. The mind becomes the servant and is used as it was intended but not to define who you are. It is not the mind's place to know the master, but the master clearly knows the mind. Watch it. See that it is moving inside of you and not you inside of it. The mind and its contents are an object to what you are. But the illusion has been that you are an object to the mind. The illusion has been that the mind knows you. If this were true, then the mind would be able to find you as something other than a thought, feeling, or physical body. The message of Advaita non-duality is that there is only one. There is only one presence awareness, one being. You are that presence awareness, that beingness, in which the universe and all possibilities arise. The apparent too, you and me are really just the one and there is nothing but that. Everything that is, exists within what you are so it is not separate from you. Everything is really the same thing, at best just appearance or movement of energy expressing in countless forms. But creation itself is finite to the presence, awareness that contains it. In the same analogy of a dream, all the characters and events are contained within the mind, so too the phenomenal is contained within what you are. Nothing that exists is separate from what you are. The mind as we have seen looks at opposites you and me or you and the chair. The two awareness you and the chair appear as the same, both the same finite energy expressing differently. The mind sees life full of choices or forks in the river of life. The mind believes that it has to choose this way or that. But there is only one river of life, the appearances of forks is an illusion. There is only oneness, one source expressing as the many. Some call this source the Tower God, but there are many other names to describe the source that is not known to the mind, but believed to be the producer of all that is. You are that source. Now, your mind may be wondering if I am suggesting that you are God. In words that the mind cannot twist itself around to understand, what you are is the source but not personified as an object the mind could recognize. You are the one and loving the illusion of being, which appears to be personified. There is a saying, taste one drop of the ocean and you know what the whole ocean tastes like. Know that source that is you, and you know the whole source of all that is, because it is you. Separateness is in the mind only. So what does the ocean taste like? It tastes like boundless peace that cannot be touched, for there is nothing to touch it. Peace that cannot be disturbed because it is the only reality. Peace that is beyond knowing. It tastes like love so whole and complete, that there is not a need for anything else, while it allows for all that is. It tastes like home. Chapter 11 Am I making progress? No. Who is there to make progress? The question of making progress is a question of the mind wanting to gain something to become something or achieve something. Behind this question are the beliefs in success and failure. The mind wants to be making progress in order to be successful at achieving something. All of this is happening within the presence, awareness that you are. 
The you that is asking the question and hoping to get it is within the presence, awareness that you are. The one that you are is already whole and complete and there is nothing to gain. What you are is in perfect working order with no improvement needed or possible. Is there anything wrong with your beingness? While this is a hopeless case for the person, the search is far from hopeless. It is not hopeless because what you are searching for is obvious and effortless. But if you are looking in the mind or relying on the mind as a measure of progress, it is not only unproductive, it is counterproductive. It is absolutely looking in the wrong direction. You are and have always been what you are seeking. The right direction, if there were such a thing, is looking anywhere without using the mind as a filter. See things as they are. The present moment is right now without any addition from the mind. If you can see the appearance outside of thought, then you will also notice that there is no need for the person you have imagined as yourself. Progress, if there were such a thing, would be to spend more time in those moments of absolute presence, awareness and in the total immediacy of right now. This is not something that you practice, just notice that it is happening now with or without the mind's participation. See that the mind will forever run into dead ends in the search for the self. It can't get it. That is why the question who am I is so powerful, it can't be answered by the mind. It is true that there is nothing to gain for the person. The question who am I undermines the beliefs in the mind that there is a person in the machine. Once that is done then who can get what? This discovery that no one is asking the question is not something that you do, it is something that just happens as a result of the questioning. Once the conceptual I is dropped by the mind as a valid center, then the door swings open to what is being pointed to, the emptiness that is full. As long as the search is going on, then there is someone searching. As long as there is someone searching the cycle continues. Go for the root. Ask the question until the mind comes up with an answer or folds under the weight of it. The statement, I still don't get it, is the most common comment from people having read and searched until they are nothing but frustration. So, if this is your concern, you are certainly not alone. During the search I had expectations of what the grand words of enlightenment, self-realization, awakening and so forth meant. In preceding chapters we have talked about how those expectations simply will not be fulfilled. The truth is much grander than those limited ideas you have so just forget about them. Easier said than done perhaps, but in order to see what is being pointed to, the expectations need to be dropped. For me, this was coming to a point where I just didn't care any more about what would be gained. It seems that as long as expectations are present in the mind, the mind will be working to fulfill them rather than being open to what is being pointed to. The thinking mind will judge the teacher, the writing, and the appearance to decide if it is good or bad as compared to the expectation. Hidden within the expectations of what self-realization is or will mean for you are expectations of what someone who has it is like. These expectations can get in the way as well. But they are perhaps more easily removed simply by meeting someone who you, the understanding. In my subjective experience, those who really understand are completely normal down to earth and imperfect as characters. Remember, we are not talking about self-improvement, we're talking about self-realization. Self-improvement is about the person and all of that improvement will be buried. Self-realization is about what you are now, and what you are now is already whole and complete. Thinking that you are going to become something is a false idea. In this book, we have talked about awareness and how everything happens within that. You may have, however, overlooked an important word and not fully considered the implications of it in the first sentence of this paragraph. You may have overlooked the word everything. The thought I still don't get it is happening within the awareness. The thought of I is happening within the awareness. The body you call yours is happening within the awareness. 
Your family, your home, your town, your state, your country, the world, the solar system, the galaxy, the universe, and the infinite space that contains all creation is happening within the awareness that you are. Being timeless and spaceless, the infinity of space and time have no meaning to you. You are the awareness that allows for all possibilities and gives validity to all things. If you will ponder the point that literally everything is happening within awareness, then perhaps you will see the true infinity of the self. Notice that pondering is also happening within the awareness, as is the one pondering. No matter how big or small, insignificant or important, it is just happening within awareness. Even the thought of it being insignificant or important is happening within awareness. You can't get away from it. You see, everything is just appearance. A grand illusion. There appears to be a thought of getting it or not getting it. There appears to be a person trying to get it. There appears to be a body. There appears to be a universe and so on. Not only is everything happening within awareness, everything is just an appearance within or upon awareness with no validity of its own. The way you think about things is an appearance. The search for self-realization, the universe and all it contains is just an appearance within and upon what you are. There is just the one source and nothing is separate from that. So the idea of you getting it is just an appearance as well, the frustration of not getting it is yet another appearance. The search for self-realization is just another possibility or appearance. The search has been an attempt to add to the person while what you are has remained in the clear, shining on and lending validity to that search. Having the understanding is just an appearance because no one has it. That is why those who understand do not say, I am enlightened. They know the I is just an appearance within what they are, that they the person are just a part of the illusion. It would be like a dream character saying they know the dreamer or they are the dreamer. It is a false claim. So that thought I still don't get it is just an appearance as will be the thought of getting it. Within the grand illusion that allows for all possibilities, the pursuit of understanding is just another possibility that arises. Since the person searching is a part of the illusion, it is not possible to get it. The understanding will come to the person when the source of the illusion is seen, but that understanding is not the actual. It is likened to the dream character coming to understand that it is dreaming. That dream character still has no independent existence. When the dream ends, so will the character. Is there anything that is not an object to what you are? Even if you are not clear on what you are, is there anything that does not appear as an object? Is the universe objective to what you are? Is the world objective to what you are? Is the body objective to what you are? Are thoughts objective to what you are? Are feelings objective to what you are? Is the sense of being objective to what you are? Again, is there anything that is not an object to what you are? Is there anything that is not an appearance to the supreme subject? On investigation the answer is clearly no. What you are is undoubtedly the supreme subject. Chapter 12, What is the Meaning Purpose of Life? This appears to be a question of great importance, but if the person asking it is just an illusion, then what purpose could be relative to the one asking? The truth makes little sense to such a profound question. The answer is that the purpose of all of this is just all of this. It is the one conscious or the source at play with itself. A dream of the source is a good analogy. It is of little consequence and appears totally superficial against the background of the presence awareness that you are. There is nothing happening. It is all just appearance within the source and the source is what you are. The use of the words you and you possibly stirred up the questions of all the suffering that is taking place throughout the world, another question of great importance. Why would the source allow or create such pain? At a whim the source could end a dream of creation, and no one would know it or even know that it ever was. 
However, what you are would remain as constant and present as it is at this moment. The content of awareness, creation, body and mind would simply be gone in the same way that a thought the mind contained a moment ago has returned to the nothing from which it came. Now, you may be thinking that this whole thing is just a cop out. But who would be copping out? This is what some call the Advaita shuffle. No matter the question, it is answered with cute phrases like the following. Who is asking? Who is there to wonder? Who is anything happening to? It can certainly be annoying to someone working towards self-realization, but who is working towards self-realization? Then there are the Advaita police, their minds are tuned to watch for the word I, and to question its every use. They too are looking for something rather than just seeing things as they are. The attention is focused on content rather than on what is being pointed to. It's like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger, or you will miss all the heavenly glory. Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon wonder why I used Bruce Lee instead of Buddha. Are you looking at the finger? The answers to the profound questions of life take care of themselves when things are seen for what they are superficial reflections of an omnipresent, omnipotent source. What is the purpose? Who wants to know? Answer the second question and the first one will bring a smile to your face. If you see what is being pointed to, don't let the mind run off in other directions. Teachers and writings for thousands of years have been pointing to this. If you now see the undeniable presence, awareness that they are pointing to, don't let your mind tell you that this must not be it because this seems so ordinary. It is it. That's simple. Now stop looking at the finger. See that the presence awareness is truly always on. It is truly unchanging and unmoving, that it never comes and goes like all appearances do. You cannot deny the validity of what you are. Let the mind soak it in and as it does, the self will begin revealing to the mind. The true guru comes forth, not as a personified being but as the true infinite nature of what you are. The work is done and the doer is no longer required. The doer was only in appearance anyway. You are that which allows loves all things to be. If you have seen the awareness that is being pointed to, let it say what cannot be expressed. When the search begins there is I am this and I am that. Then there is just I am. Then not even that. Everything is discarded or dismantled. The illusion crumbles. What remains is beyond words. The One the books are thrown away as they pale to what is. The words are just pointers. Day with that which lovingly allows for everything to appear in peace that cannot be disturbed. Allow it to show you the depth of its void and the fullness of its emptiness. What higher purpose could there be to life than to live it as you truly are? The question may arise, why am I here? This is clearly a question of the mind, as, by nature, the mind attempts to string events together to form a cause, effect relationship to happenings. Are you here because your parents met and conceived you? Would you be here if their parents had not met? Perhaps a thousand years ago a man was lost and asked what would become your thirtieth great-grandmother for directions. If he had not been lost, would you be here? If life had not formed in the primordial soup, would you be here? If the countless number of events had not occurred precisely as they did since the primordial soup, would you be here? The whole creation has to cooperate for any seemingly one thing to occur. As in the butterfly effect, can a butterfly flapping its wings on one side of the world cause a tidal wave on the other? Life is one river and it does not have branches. It is one flow, one expression, one dream. When we look for a cause or reason for things to be, we see that there is no single cause, as the mind would like to believe. There is just one cause and from that all things are. You are because of the one cause. You as the appearance, 
can be not different than you are because there is no independence to the person. Remember the river of life? The manifest is one undivided river, one expression of energy appearing as the many. Because of this there is no independent nature to what you are. Every seemingly separate thing is dependent and moving along with the whole river. As the supreme subject, the person you take yourself to be is allowed to be without condition or judgment. The supreme subject accepts the appearance as it is, because it can be no different. As this recognition unfolds, the understanding of your true nature becomes clear. The conflicts are in the mind, you as the supreme subject love to be. Chapter 13 Why If there is no purpose, how and why did all of this come about? Creation, the universe, is because the sense of being arose in the one. You are for the very same reason. In this book we have talked about beingness, being what you are. There comes a time when even that point or that concept can be dropped. Consider the analogy that in sleep prior to a dream, there is a void or emptiness, no thing. Then the dream appears. It arises spontaneously and nothing is actually happening. So it is for the one. In the beginning there was the one at peace with itself. In the one, the sense of being arrows, and just as the nightly dream spontaneously arises, so creation appears. The one knows space, time, and creation to be unreal against the one reality which it is. As the source, the one knows itself as the sole reality even while loving the appearance of beingness. The one is loving to be, and knowing that in truth nothing is really happening. To further the analogy, creation is a dream of the one and the dream is not separate from the one, just as the nightly dream is not separate from the organism dreaming. Creation could come to an end at any moment and the one, that is the single reality, would remain, nothing would be missed. Because no one is born and no one dies, just as in a nightly dream, the suffering that appears to take place within creation is not real. All the events of creation are not real. They are, as we have discussed, just appearances within the One. As Nisargadatta Maharaj said, a man who moves with the earth will necessarily experience days and nights. He who stays with the sun will know no darkness. My world is not yours. As I see it, you all are on a stage performing. There is no reality about your comings and goings. And your problems are so unreal. Nisargadatta Maharaj was speaking from the perspective of the one, not the mind. If you imagine your nightly dream for a moment, knowing that it is just a spontaneous creation of the mind, could you not say the same words about the characters in your dream that Nisargadatta Maharaj said about the appearance of the world and the characters in it? All of creation is appearance within the one. The appearance does not touch the one. The one loves to be and so the appearance is. There is no further purpose than that. The appearance exists within the peace of the one and does not disturb that peace. You as the person are just an illusion or a dreamed appearance. You the true self, that which is present aware, that which is the beingness, is likened to the drop in the ocean. Taste the drop and you know the taste of the whole ocean. Know the self and you know the one, for there is no difference and no separation from that. The sense of presence, the sense of beingness arose in what you are and so follows the appearance of the person. The peace that is the source is your peace. The love that is the source is your love. The timeless, spaceless presence that is the one is you. There is nothing that the mind can say about it. There is nothing you need to do to achieve what you already are, nothing that needs to be acquired to be more of what you already are, and nothing that needs to be improved upon. For the ocean and the drop, there is nothing else. There is no separation between the drop and the ocean except in the mind. Consider again the words from chapter 12, stay with that which lovingly allows for everything to appear in peace that cannot be disturbed. 
allow it to show you the depth of its void and the fullness of its emptiness. The only things standing in the way of clearly seeing what is being pointed to are the false ideas you have about who you are. These false ideas are easily dissolved with investigation and all that remains is the reality of the one, just as it has always been. Nothing new is added. You already are what you seek. Chapter 14 The Origin of I Am In the last chapter we discussed how creation came into existence. Prior to that when in the one the sense of being arrows, with it arose the sense of I am. This is why your own beingness is such a clear pointer to your ultimate true nature. The sense of being is the source of the thought I am. The beingness that is sensed by the mind is the same beingness of the one. Some point by saying that there is only one and not even that. This is pointing to that which is the one prior to the sense of beingness. The sense of beingness is the very root cause of all appearance. The one, the source or God is so far removed from what the mind can conceive or perceive that even the presence of beingness is superficial and a mere enjoyment of the one. The mind however is confused by this sense of beingness because it cannot grasp it. Because it cannot grasp it, the mind chooses to ignore it or just overlooks it to the best of its ability and settles on the idea that I am. The thought I am is only a reflection of the one's experience of itself. The mind, as we have seen, is a part of the creation that arose from the one. The mind, being dual, senses the beingness and sees the appearance of creation. In that lies the illusion of separation. In order to break the spell of separation one only needs to realize that the concept of me, the idea that I am, is just a thought pointing back to that beingness and to see that without that beingness, nothing would be. To see that even without that sense of beingness you are. In that presence nothing else is needed, required, wanted or happening. In that presence in the beingness that you are lies the ultimate peace, you are that. Chapter 15, The End of Suffering The One, Sense of Beingness, I Am, Creation, Ego Mind, Separation, Suffering Some paths break these down into various levels of mind and get for why complex with the structure, especially regarding the mind. Here we are going to stay simple because the objective is to see for yourself, not to learn a system. The One is the only reality yet lends its reality to the other appearances. In the one, the sense of beingness arises and gives birth to the I am. The idea that I am gives birth to creation. Creation gives birth to the ego, the expression of individuality and the sense of separation, and from that suffering is born. All human suffering is due to a case of mistaken identity a core belief in a conceptual separate self. This appears as an unexamined assumption that there is a me, a self-center that exists as a separate entity. On investigation this me is found to be a phantom. On looking directly into our actual experience, there is a seeing into the illusory nature of this self we call I or me. Then the realization dawns that this apparent me, is nothing more substantial than a thought appearing in the open space of pure presence awareness. In simple terms you is only in the mind, it does not exist anywhere else. Its apparent cause is the ego or idea of me, and with that comes the sense of separation. When the mind is put to the task of answering the question, Who am I? It can find no one. At that point, self-centered suffering begins to evaporate. What is left is the one. Sense of beingness. I am. Creation. When creation is seen to be temporal and as the undivided river of life, when the sense of your own beingness becomes more real than the ever-changing appearance, you are left with the one. Sense of beingness. I am. Remember I am came from the sense of beingness. Yet, you are without the thought of I am. That sense of beingness is not required for the one to be, so it can be dropped without regard, and then there is just, the one. 
the one is the only reality and because you are, you are that. You are that which lovingly allows for all things. You are the spaceless, timeless reality.